Do not allow your eyes and ears, your hearts and minds to become eclipsed by the greatness of art. Because when it comes to art, understand that real art is a catharsis, a release of pinned up pressure, causing the formation of something new, a new energy. And in the 70s, the South Bronx fostered this energy. It needed this energy because so much was lost in the combination of white exodus, coupled with the dwindling socioeconomic opportunities that created a dystopia in New York City. In 1950, 90% of its residents were white. By 1980, two thirds were black and Puerto Rican, a major shift. The city was so abandoned that areas look like post-apocalyptic war. It's like a twilight zone. How did this happen? And how did it ferment one of the greatest cultural movements in black and brown history, urban history, American history, my identity? Well, with the loss of economic opportunity and city neglect came a rise in gangs, drugs, violence, and crime. Landlords burned down buildings for insurance purposes, leaving the place in ruins. With urban planning spearheaded by New York's master builder, Robert Moses, a straight up racist, he ensured that whites would be firewalled from the urban sprawl of Puerto Rican and black occupants from the South Bronx and surrounding areas. He repeatedly abused his power to entrench racial and economic segregation. For example, he intentionally ordered the overpasses of the connected parkway to Jones Beach State Park too low for buses so that what? Poor people and particularly black families could not access the beach. He built parks far from Puerto Rican and African American neighborhoods. And the South Bronx became the repository or better yet, the dumpster for New York's unwanted and neglected. But we've seen this story time and time again in Detroit, Compton, Oakland, Cleveland, Kansas City, and so many more American cities that felt black people were repugnant. But something different happened in the South Bronx, a cultural upheaval that turned disparity into something so beautiful, something so prideful and destined, a connection that we all felt and still feel. It's called hip hop. And I'm not merely talking about the music. I'm talking about the culture of people that came together to symbolize strength and rebellion through creative revolution and organizing. I'm talking about a cultural change that liberated the hearts and minds of people around the world. It changed the way I was perceived. It made me walk and talk different. It taught me that Elvis was a hero to most. And then I needed to learn more about my dismissed history. My people that shared oral history through Negro spirituals, the blues, jazz to soul. Here they found a new medium. It's hip hop, it's who I am. It's what raised me, it reinforced my identity. It's why I rocked vintage Ralph Lauren and swung my dreads for 14 years. It's why I picked up a book to learn more about me and people of color. One of the books I picked up is called Can't Stop, Won't Stop, History of Hip Hop Generation. The book was well received, showcasing the academic and contextualized vantage point of its author. It was released in 2005, a time when there wasn't too many books on the ideology of the culture. What I loved about this book was the political angle. And this author continued to weave this perspective into successive books like we gonna be all right and who we be. He's written extensively on culture, politics, and the arts for major outlets and has received a litany of awards for his journalistic and academic achievements. He's a senior advisor at Race Forward and served as the executive director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford. 
He's also a co-founder of one of my favorite labels, Soul Sides. He's an Asian American icon that continues to provide credence to our urban culture. I'm pleased to welcome my brother, Mr. Jeff Chang. How are you, man? I'm uh, I'm blown away. That was uh, <laughs> just beautiful. That was just Thank beautiful. You. Yes. And Thank you. So full of truth. So full of your your pain and joy and just thank you man thank you for uh allowing me to be able to share space with you no uh, no that's a mutual thing and and it's this space sharing has been been overdue because i've been a fan of of you for many years and you know there's so much to talk about um but i would like to start off with this how has the the art of hip hop pedagogy and i say this from the standpoint of artists teaching their fans and professors mm -hmm. teaching students mm -hmm. boosted the social awareness and power of people of color around the world mm. Mm. um well you know i i think hip-hop has always had as part of it right this this um this thing of of being able to carry the seeds for survival mm. um and so to to kind of go back to a lot of the things that you were talking about in that beautiful intro. Um, you know, hip hop has been the repository of the stories of people who have been shunned, who have been abandoned, who have been pushed to the side, um, black people uh, and uh, Puerto Rican people, right? Uh, folks of African descent um, in this country and hip hop being sort of that latest version of what uh, Mary Baraka called the changing same, right? Like sort of that, uh, that, that latest kind of version of, of uh, a place to be able to carry the emotion of um, a people, but also the stories of a people and the, the ways to be able to kind of move things forward. So, you know, it's funny because I, I feel like when the book came out, when the book first came out in 2005, there was this debate about whether or not hip hop should be in the universities. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, hip hop's always been educational, right? Hip hop's right. always been a repository for these stories that will never, uh, will, will at that time we thought would never make it into the mainstream, um, yeah. but that people needed to be able to, to continue to survive. So, um, you know, I think about hip hop studies or hip hop pedagogy or, you know, whatever we kind of, uh, call it as part and parcel of this calling of of those of us who work in the arts and in the culture. It's just something that that we need to kind of maintain because this is the people's language. This is the people's culture. This is the people's you know stories. This is the people's history, um, and that's how I approach Can't Stop, Won't Stop. Yeah, it's, it's it's interesting because when these books started to come out, right, providing this academic vantage point on on our culture. It was, it was exciting, you know, because yeah. what we believed in was becoming legitimized, right? Mm -hmm. And it's analogous to jazz, actually. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, how long did it take for jazz to be part of the curriculum at places mm -hmm. like Juilliard and all this stuff? You know, I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's. I, I don't really like to use the, the term urban too much, but for yeah. purposes of the discussion, Urban art just doesn't get the love it's supposed to. It takes so long mm -hmm. for the culture to be recognized, you know? And, uh, you know, for years, you've taught a class called Can't Stop, Won't Stop at Stanford, and you use hip hop to show how the U.S. and the world has changed in the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Why is politics one of the big topical issues that you have paid attention to? Because, you know, it's the context for from which all of this work is created. So go back to jazz, right? Uh, yeah. Black improvised music, right? Yes. Uh, black American improvised music, right? Um, which is, I think, what a lot of the, 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 the giants of jazz would have wanted it to be called, right? Um, and, and then that not necessarily getting the kind of love that it deserved in institutions of higher education, the academy, those kinds of places, because it's the same way that that um, people have denigrated the arts of Black folks and people of color, uh, our communities um, over time, 
uh, and that it didn't fit into whiteness. Uh, so just like, like, you know, like me being able to, to kind of get up at a class at Stanford and be able to talk about this kind of stuff. Um, I mean, I, I, I joke about it because I'm of Chinese and native Hawaiian descent. So I'd be like, look, you know, Chinese built the railroads, which built Stanford. So everything that I get here <laughs> is reparations. And, and if I can help other folks get their cultural reparations, right? Like yeah, then, yeah, yeah. then that, I mean, the class was like, we taught it in that kind of a way, right? Like the, yeah. the kind of history that you wouldn't get in American history 101 mm -hmm. type of thing, right? And the kind of stories that you would, you wouldn't get um, in that. And, and we, we still kind of, you know, me and, and Davey D, um, Davey teaches at San Francisco State and he's uh, my partner in, in creating this new version for young adults mm -hmm. that just came out this year. That's Congrats. how we've, you know, that's how we've approached it. That's we we've approached it as, as this thing of restoring, right? Like, it, it there's this concept that we kick around called cultural justice, which is in part about really restoring the things that that folks tried to take away from from us. They took away our languages. They tried to take right. away, you know, for obviously, you know, for black folks who tried to take away the drum, right? They tried right. to take away so many things and. And then it's been this long haul, right, of like hundreds of years to be able to get back to a point where we might be able to have some sort of exact, some sort of cultural justice. And it's not a bloody kind of justice. It's not like right. a, something that results in people getting hurt. This, right. is, this is something that results in people uh, getting, uh, getting smarter, getting more Absolutely. connected to each other, getting Absolutely. like, you know, more uh, together. And, and I think that that's like the, the ultimate goal that, that we, we all have. Well, uh, so I love to say that complacency breeds disregard for the innocent and hip hop was the wow. way for, you know, black and brown people to fight back. Yeah. And, and this is symbiotic of the blues, is symbiotic yeah. of jazz, mm -hmm. symbiotic of, of soul, but hip hop did it in a whole kind of different way, you mm -hmm. know? Um, but something that I like that you talk about, can you talk about how, the post-civil rights era mm -hmm. helped to spawn this culture of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people talk about the civil rights movement now as this sort of second reconstruction, right? So, you know, uh, after the civil war, there was this short period in American history where a lot of things moved forward, where there was a lot of restorative, transformative justice. Right. Um, you know, and, and then there was a, the door kind of slammed shut on that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we had Jim Crow and we had lynchings, mm -hmm. we had, mm -hmm. um, we had violence, uh, you know, uh, against, uh, black folks, uh, the, the wiping out the genocide of native folks, like mm -hmm. the, the killing and the, the, the running out of, of Asians and mm -hmm. all across the West. Um, and the post-civil rights era has been this era after a second reconstruction, right? If we think of the 50s and the 60s as this era in which the U.S. is actually making openings, new openings for, for black folks and people of color led by, led by black folks, the post-civil rights era has been this era where that door is kind of slammed shut, and that's the era that we grew up in. And so a lot of our energies got transferred from like politics. Like That's not a battlefield that we could fight on anymore. Mm -hmm. But we could fight in the culture, and I th I feel like our whole generation, like we, a lot of our energy went into creativity, mm -hmm. and in in sustaining and building up the culture, and through that, we were able to to make inroads back into uh, into politics. So you know the the story of of hip hop is that the, the story of hip hop is these like abandoned folks um, from the diaspora, from the African diaspora coming together, bringing together the sounds of the diaspora, bringing together the dances and the movements and the, the visual poetry and the, you know, wordplay and the poetry of that and in, in, into uh, a space where it becomes like a laboratory, like the Bronx becomes like this laboratory. And folks are incredibly creative and this literally spawns a movement that spreads to black neighborhoods throughout the U.S. And then uh, across uh, the U.S. and around the world, um, and that's the the story of how this post civil rights era gets kind of redeemed. 
in a way. All of these like, you know, laws that get put into place to limit and contain uh, black people, especially young black people, uh, especially during our era, during the 80s and the 90s, right? That's now like exploded into all of these weaponized attacks on, you know, on people like, Mm -hmm. you know, in Ferguson and in the streets all over the place. And hip hop is the story of the counter narrative. It's the story of those people who are in the streets. Um, Mm. And so, you know, that's, that's the, the kind of thing that we, we try to talk about. Like we want to get out of this post civil rights era into like a new era, a third reconstruction. Right. And I feel like we're almost on the brink of that. And the culture yeah. has just been the foundation for us to be able to get there. Well, you know, I remember, uh, so when I was in, let's see, when I was the, the summer of third grade, mm-hmm. I, I was living in upstate New York in a small place called Canton, New York, like mm-hmm. a couple hours from Syracuse. Okay. And we were, my family was going to move to Southern California. Mm. And before we were doing that, we drove down to Atlanta because I have a lot of family in Atlanta and they were flying from Atlanta to the West Coast. I will never forget, it was 1986. Mm. And I'm driving, well, I'm not, I'm in the back seat. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm in the back seat. Uh And I wake up, it's nighttime and I'm in Manhattan. And I mean, I grew up everything Beat Street, everything breaking, everything <laughs> yeah. breaking too. I knew all the words for everything. I wanted to be turbo. Like that was my whole thing. <laughs> I was uh-huh. like, you know, I was super, super, super hip hop as a young kid. I was the only black dude in my yeah. all white area. I mean, they were Amish mm. in my area. That's how white my area was, right? Wow. So this is the first time I'm seeing everything I'm seeing on these movies. Mm-hmm. I'm seeing the types of abandoned buildings that I saw in Beat Street. Mm-hmm. And I'm seeing graffiti and I'm feeling the elements of hip hop and I'm seeing how style and creativity became the new weapon of choice and it was something that was so visceral and real that a part of me wished i could have grown grew up around that Mm. because of how special that time was as far as our culture fighting back Mm -hmm. can you provide some perspective as to how gangs Mm -hmm. turn to the four or five elements, mm-hmm. however elements you want to say, in yeah. order to fight back mm-hmm. against disparity. Yeah. It's, you know, again, it's part of the greatest story ever told. So, you know, mm-hmm. what you have is is uh, a black power movement, right, happening uh, in the mid to the late 60s all across the country. You know, the rise, I'm out here in, in, in Berkeley, uh, North Oakland, California, and you know, the Black Panthers, of course, get their start, like, right down mm-hmm. the street over here wow. in, in 1966. Um, they're passing out, like, Mao Zedong's Little Red Book, and they're, mm-hmm. they're trying to organize the community, um, you know, for, for their 10-point platform. And um, that, in, you know, that inspires, of course, in turn, you know, all these other communities to get organized, the Chicano community, the Asian American community, the Native American community. Mm. But the Black Panthers get their thing started and they come to New York and they find a foothold in, in neighborhoods like the Bronx. But by 1969, literally the police have shut down the Black Panthers all across the country. It's mm. part of um, a massive government mm. um, program. It's not even a conspiracy because they're like, real about this this is a plan they literally call it a counterintelligence program to yeah, yeah. infiltrate the black panthers and to shut them down right. and right. so you know tupac's mom is part of the new york 21 mm-hmm. and once the the panthers are moved out of the neighborhoods uh where they're doing positive organizing you know and they're working with the young lords and they're working with uh, a bunch of people to clean up the communities and to be able to try to you know, lift the communities up and make demands on government. Um, 
you know, there's a vacuum. And into that vacuum, and the same thing happens in Los Angeles, into that vacuum, you have people who uh, take the skills of organizing, uh, but they organize uh, to be able to try to establish power over their neighborhoods. And these folks get called gangs, right? The street organizations right. that get called gangs. And what happens is by 1971, there's so many gangs all across the Bronx. You have one gang starting up on one block, and so another gang starts up in in defense of, of themselves against that other block. Um, and the whole neighborhood is divided up into these grids. There's so many of them that this violence reaches a peak. And they have a choice to be able to get to a point where they're really going to like just engage in this all-out war, which is exactly what the government wants, exactly what the FBI wants, or they're going to figure out how to piece it up. And they come together, and they they form peace. And that happens at the end of 1971. And so by the summer of 1972, what you have is, is people starting to come out on the streets looking for parties, looking for places to, to hang out together. Um, and this whole new Bronx sound is kind of taking place. And this, the, I mean... You know, like this is all the music that that you've been able to reintroduce and like update and flip and like take yeah. to the next level. Like this the stuff, breaks. right? This, yeah, right. all the breaks, right? All the mm -hmm. stuff that that um, we love so deeply and dearly, right? Mm -hmm. This is that sound that's emerging in '72. By '73, what you have is folks don't want to be in gangs anymore. They uh, and they're freed from having to feel like they need to join gangs. Mm. So now they can basically figure out okay well where's, where's the party at we can actually party out in the parks now it's not like that this gang or that gang controls the park anymore now we can go and hang out and stuff and so that's where cindy campbell gets the idea to throw a party and have her brother mm -hmm. um clive who mm -hmm. gets known as dj cool Hurt, mm -hmm. throw his party right. um august 11 1973 we're like nearly up on what is it i mean i can't even do the math but we're nearly up on on the 50th on, uh, right yeah, on the fiftieth yeah. anniversary of this, yeah. uh, so it's just it's a it's a powerful uh, type of thing that then kind of takes hold in the Bronx, and that becomes a model. It's like the violence stops, but the violence dies down dramatically, and people like are able to turn their energies into creativity and right, and it's just the greatest story ever told. You man. know, it's so it, yeah. th that it is. It's so ill because you know with hip hop we separated ourselves culturally, you know, uh, linguistically, you know, mm -hmm. it's a time when art became more than a subculture. It's, it's, it became our ethnicity. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I am hip hop, you are hip hop. Mm -hmm. And, and I say that with the same pride of declaring myself black or somebody else is Chinese or somebody else mm -hmm. is Mexican. It was like a new sense of pride yeah. and, and style became the new model for stratification. Mm -hmm. That's what's really deep. I mean, yeah. I grew up, you know, a super hip hop head, big time dancer, you know, um, I would travel to battle whoever, you know, and dance to like, it <laughs> yeah. was everything. And it was, and it yeah. was all about who is the illest, right? Yeah. yeah. And, and, and with this, we were using this energy to compete with style yeah, and clothing was a tool that we use for identity, right? So, absolutely. you know what yeah. I'm saying? If yeah. we go, we could go from the Dapper Dan's, right? Yeah. To the Ralph Lauren yeah. runs to, to even like Versace, all that stuff. We're using this stuff for identity. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's so interesting how this concept of identity goes centuries back, you know, as yeah. far as us kind of proving who we are, right? Yeah. Because, if we look at, let's say, antebellum period, let's say pre pre Civil War, mm -hmm. you know, if there was a black free man with a white person, yeah, the use of fine clothing could render that black person as potentially being free, you know, right. and the and and they could kind of circumvent the slave patrol, mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at even old bulletins for runaway slaves, mm. they would say something like. Because we didn't have a lot of last names, so it'd be like his name is is Isaiah, mm -hmm. and he ran away and he wore the master's clothing just to say, wow. when you see this fine black man dressed up, yeah. don't get tricked into thinking he's a free man, yeah. right? 
So yeah. it's like it's all these perspectives, and and because I always say clothing is a pub- public performance. Clothing is a way to show who you are, and then we could connect this to minstrelsy, blackface, because we were associated with character caricatures of blackness mm-hmm. displayed by those in blackface. Right. Uh, you know where we were having tattered clothes clothes on, and we were dingy, and we were simple minded, mm-hmm. but you know with style, we wanted to be aspirational Mm -hmm. and and we use this to usurp social perspectives as a way to get self-dignity yeah Uh, and it's illuminated by a flare of what i like to call like original self presentation it was us unapologetically being us and demanding our respect just like jazz just, you know, like, jazz. just yeah. like jazz, you know, mm-hmm. it's like turning yeah. the tables, you know what yep. I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and I so think like, about, yeah, no, I was just thinking about like what you're making me think of too, is just like, you know, it, this has been, uh, it's been interesting because over the last three months I've been asked to do a lot of stuff around Asian American history. Mm-hmm. And that of course leads you back into all of these connections with, um, black history and as well with Mexican history. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about, as you're talking about all this, right, mm-hmm. about the value uh, that people place on like looking good. Oh, man. you know, just oh, thinking yeah. about like Filipino farm workers, for instance, yes. in the 1930s, they used to have these things where it was a bachelor society and and the only like kind of relief that they got from this brutal work was being able to go to the dances Mm. on saturdays and mm-hmm. you'd have like white women there mm-hmm. and the men would just get dressed to the nines you mm-hmm. know what i mean mm-hmm. and they get dressed to the nines to go in yes, yes. and and be able to spend you know you pay a, you pay whatever a, a nickel or whatever you get a dance with the lady and stuff like that and if you're super fly and you got some game yeah, you might yeah. even you might even get a little <laughs> bit further with that right like <laughs> these women are like they're getting money for for uh, for dances and then you know yes. they're getting money for other things but they got their choice right, right, right of what they right. can do that night so right so the men are the men are dressed in the nines but then the other thing that happens that uh, is that that gets the white guys you know in the next town over or whatever like angry about it mm-hmm. and it's a simple similar type of thing so you have these riots that jump off mm-hmm. where where people are attacked because they're dre- they're just dressing well they just they right. And you know the same thing with the zoot suitors in yes, Los exactly. Angeles, right? Right. And and in the 1940s, how like the the sailors come and they're able to target these folks. They're just they're out on a Saturday night. These Mexican guys just looking good. Yes. And and that makes them a target and stuff. But it's it's like you want to have that pride in yourself and you want to be able to express yourself, um, and that becomes a threat sometimes to. To folks, as it has throughout history, like in the way that jazz was shut down and all these other kinds of things. Well, okay, so I remember when I was younger, Mm -hmm. and this was a time before hip hop. People don't realize that hip hop wasn't mainstream. Like they, like they can't even fathom that. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, they can't even fathom like pre pre ninety three. Mm-hmm. What radio programming was regarding hip hop, like they have, they can't even fathom, right? Yeah, yeah but like, if we listen to hip hop, this was a close knit community because mm-hmm. rap music became. It was like a, I like to refer to it as like a cultural telegram, disseminating responses to cultural oppression and racism. And right. and I remember going out on the street, and if I saw somebody with like cross colors or baggy jeans and some Reebok running shoes or some Air Max or something and a striped rugby shirt. It's like, oh, yo, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's dope, yeah, yo, yeah, they yeah. hip hop. But yeah. that wasn't a norm. That was not no, a normal thing. Most people no. weren't into that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. when you were young, when you were younger, you were in Honolulu, right? I was in Honolulu, yeah. Mm-hmm. So how was hip hop represented out there? I mean, it was the same type of thing. I'm thinking about like you in 1986, right? Like I'm in Hawaii in the early 80s, and mm-hmm. you know we're seeing like Beach Street, we're seeing like Breaking. You know, mm-hmm. there's a uh, folks come back and forth from California to to Hawaii, so you know the music comes over and the dances come over in that way. There's there's people who are locking, 
you know, mm -hmm. there's people mm -hmm. who are popping, there's people who are doing all those kinds of things. And it was the same type of thing. Like if you, if you were going to get up on a weekend and stuff, like, you know, you're going to dress in your, in these big, like Cavarici, you know, <laughs> sort of big fat, yeah. you know, with the peg legs yeah. and, right, right, right. you know, the sort of like, whatever, you know, yeah, yeah. kind of creepers and all. Yeah. yeah so all of that stuff. Rayons, right? you're wearing yes. a, Exactly. So you were, you were like, you, you would be marking yourself in that way. Like this mm -hmm. is, this is what I'm down for and that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, and then I, I came to California in 85, 86, moved up here and it was the same type of thing, you know, like on Telegraph back then, um, people like would gather, there was like, you know, people would cruise in their cars all weekend down Crenshaw in LA or up here on Telegraph Avenue. Everybody would come from all over the Bay and then just cruise and like bump music and people would, there'd be ciphers everywhere. And, um, and it was, it was kind of like this thing that, that, that it was like a, like you said, it's a tele, I love that. I love that idea of a telegram. Like, yeah. you know, that's like, I'm connecting with you because that's like how you're representing yourself. And I right. see you. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and, and when, when I think about the Bronx, when I think about this birthplace of hip hop, it, it, it illuminates a question. And the question is, why does white flight seem to precede the immediate mm. socioeconomic disasters that occur in mm -hmm. a lot of these once great cities? Mm -hmm. And it's like, is it because white people are better and people of color are just eugenically inferior? And mm. also, you know, why do these cultural shifts cause fear, even amongst blacks, Latinos, and Asian Americans? Yeah. Like, wh why do we yeah. perpetuate this mythology? We buy into it. Yeah. I mean, the the there's there's a lot of reasons, and it and it goes back to like this de facto government sanctioned segregation that occurs mm -hmm. after World War II. Mm -hmm. So you really want to get down to it. What happens is is you have the government funding these banks that make these loans mm -hmm. only to white families, right? After World War II, mm -hmm. so you know people come back from the war and that kind of thing. And, you know, they're like, we're going to establish like an American middle class. Mm -hmm. So where the government is like, we're going to give these, the money to the banks to be able to make these home loans. And we're going to have you go out and build up these suburbs. Well, these suburbs are whites only, you know, yeah. uh, they're, they're set up to be, to be whites only. And the banks are set up to give money only to white folks. Mm -hmm. And so the white folks leave the cities at this particular point, right? They, they are thinking, well, gosh, I can get a bigger house. Like, like I can get, you know, all of the trappings of, of, of middle class hood, like a washer, dryer, you know, two and a half kids, a dog and, and a, and a, and a Plymouth or whatever, you know what I'm saying? A Ford, <laughs> yes. um, you know what I'm saying? A white yeah. picket fence right. and, 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 and all of the money, all of the government money moves out of the cities and goes to the suburbs with them. Yes. And so, you know, at that particular point you have uh, the folks who can't afford to move and won't get loans to be able to, to move, you know, left in these neighborhoods. And they're restricted from being able to move because, like I said, these suburbs are all white. There's contracts literally that are written that are saying you can't sell to a black person Restrictive or a covenants. Chinese person, yeah. Yeah, or a Chinese person yeah. or a Mexican person. Right. And all of this is the, the kind of thing where it's like, it, this is sold as the American dream, but in, in this particular period and up till now, that dream is largely not available, you know, to, to black folks and communities of color. Right. And, um, and that's what we live with. You know, like when you think about wealth and you think about money, right? Like if, if somebody who was able to buy a house in like 1949, they pass that house on to their kids mm -hmm. and this, those kids pass it on to their kids and they pass it on to their kids. And those kids are now like, our peers, right? And they'll pass it on to their kids. Yes. If I don't have a house to pass on to somebody, right? You think of these four generations already, they've built up all of this wealth. Most people don't realize that in most of these cities, racism is actually built into the infrastructure. And built what you said is a, yeah. is a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. But taking this back to hip hop. Right. Hip hop, help to provide a filter to the world 
a right. filter to the world to accept us and mm -hmm. to see us in a whole new light. Um, I want to connect this to something that Roger Ebert said in 95. Oh, wow. Okay. He said, uh, rap has a bad reputation in white circles where many people believe it consists of obscene and violent anti-white and anti-female guttural. Mm -hmm. Some of it does. Most does not. Mm -hmm. Most white listeners don't care. They hear black voices in a litany of discontent and tune out. Yet rap plays the role today as Bob Dylan did in 1960, giving voice to the hopes and angers of a generation and a lot of rap is powerful writing so based on his explanation of the way hip-hop is interpreted by many white listeners mm -hmm. how does this theory apply to the global acclaim of the beastie boys a group yeah. that i actually greatly admire mm -hmm. well like the beastie boys are kids who um recognize the setup after a while i think that at the beginning they were just they were just like we were, you know, they were kids mm. who wanted to skate, meet right. girls, hang out, you know, um, be cool, whatever, just do their thing. And I think that they uh, were able to recognize as they got deeper into their, like, they were, they became fans of Bad Brains. They became fans of Run DMC. They became, they became fans of, of Public Enemy. Um, and they were able to kind of start seeing, you know, what exactly they had been given yeah privilege wise and what you know and what created um the kind of segregation that they actually helped to break down in, mm -hmm. in in society in a lot of ways so it's a really really deep kind of thing because you know it it what it does is is it kind of tells you the story and this is not just for whites but i think it's also for for those of us who are who are not black um, as well, that there's a certain kind of way in which you have to be able to see through everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and hip hop allows people who are not black to be able to see through like the mm -hmm. setup, the racial hierarchy setup, right? Yeah. That, that America is kind of placed in our way. And even as some of like our peers and our parents and, you know, our loved ones, our families are like trying to climb yeah. right trying to assimilate or become white as fast as they can right. right like we're seeing well wait a minute what is that american dream really all about mm -hmm. is that really about living in a segregated kind of suburb you know and and hating the people that you never get to meet because you're sequestered mm -hmm. and you're kind of quarantined in your little suburb right yeah. like that's i think the the thing that hip-hop allowed the beastie boys to be able to do was to was to really understand like if you're listening to Bad Brains or you're listening yeah. to Run DMC and stuff, like you're listening to like the sound of of Black America, and you're listening yeah. to what you know what that's coming from, and you need to be able to get deep into that to be able to really get uh, you know where that's going. Um, but it's the possibility that we all have. I mean, here's here's the thing, and you know it better than anybody. Like Black music is American music. Right. Everybody likes to say, oh, American pop, American pop, as if black music is like something separate. No, black music defines American pop. Yeah. And American pop defines global pop. So black American music defines world popular music, mm. right? It sets the stage for world popular music. And the thing that's so deep about that is if we got to hear and understand in the music, in the musical notes and the rhythms and, and as well as the words, like what's really going on? We would all be free. I just think that like people don't. Yeah. People, you know, there's so much that's set up against people actually hearing what's right there in front of us every single day, every single moment, and that's where we have to kind of break down as artists. If you think about this, right? Yeah. Um, going back to let's go back to the blues and jazz, right? Sure. So, blues is a Black American art. Jazz mm -hmm. is a Black American art. These were two these were two form two, two forms of music that allowed the black person to usurp the power structure that whites held over them. Mm -hmm. So for example, 
when it came to jazz music and going into like a real underground jazz club, black people were the judge and whites had to ask blacks if they were good enough. That's right. But if you apply that to the concept of pop versus urban today, mm -hmm. yes, it is all black music, but there's a reason why urban is separated mm -hmm. from pop. Mm -hmm. It's where the money's gonna go, right? Right, but, right, right, right. Mm -hmm. But if we go back, like mm -hmm. hip hop, jazz became an, an American craze in the 20s and 30s. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's a time when music was coming into American homes via what? Record players and radio stations. Radio for the radio first stations. time, right? Yeah, exactly. All these yeah. sounds were traveling around America. So it's the first time the black voice was mm -hmm. seeping into the white living room. Right. right? right. I mean, there's a reason why these records had to be or were labeled race records, right? Mm -hmm. The cheaper yeah. versions. Yeah. So, the most venerable jazz pioneer of the time, Duke Ellington, mm -hmm. but Paul Whiteman, a Jewish yeah. performer, was labeled as the king of jazz. Right. A jazz king who didn't perform with black musicians at the time under the notion that it would hurt his career. Right. He filtered this new sound for white people like the Beastie Boys did. I might have been taking any credit away from Beastie Boys. I might have been mm -hmm. saying that. Yeah. So, but in the 30s, we had. Benny Goodman, mm -hmm. who became the king of swing, mm -hmm. even though we had Count Basie, right? Mm -hmm. So we all know how Elvis served as a filter to spread black music. I, I say this all to ask the following question. Mm -hmm. Is it okay for people to adopt an exclusive black and brown agenda when it comes to certain types of art? An mm -hmm. exclusionary form of affirmative action in order to preemptively protect black artists from the misappropriation of their musical culture. Now, essentially, should mm. people become stigmatized against non-Black musicians playing Black music based on the vantage point that history provides, mm -hmm. canonizing the white musicians over the Black ones? Ah, this is such a great question. Yeah. How much, how much time do we have? Uh, to go for it. <laughs> <laughs> go for it. So listen. <laughs> and it extends, right, all the way up yeah. to now, right? Like, You're we right, talk right, right. about how Rolling Stone literally has a cover with Eminem on it in the early 2000s, crowning him, like Rolling Stone, this rock magazine, rock magazine. Yes, That's yes. We yes. talk about rock, too, right? Right, 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 right. exactly. The king of rock. Right. We talk about Elvis, right? right? But right. Eminem, like, the king of hip-hop, right? Yes. And, and uh, all of this type of stuff. We have a whole chapter in this new version of Can't Stop, Won't Stop About Dope. It, because we're trying to get like young folks to actually think about these kinds of questions. Yes. Right. The way that culture gets appropriate, you, your word misappropriated. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and the way in which um, black innovators and creators, pioneers get erased yes. um, and exploited and extracted from. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the, 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 the part of the debate that like we should all agree on. Mm hmm. We should all agree that the way that the culture is set up is that black artists, black pioneers, black creators have been extracted from, exploited, and erased. Like that should just be factual basis for us to start this debate on. Yeah. Um, like what you laid out, right? That whole history of, of, of blues and jazz, that should be a factual basis that we begin this discussion from. What my question is, is, where do we want to go from here? What I think is the case is, and I'm going to qualify this by saying, I recognize that I'm coming from a point of view where I'm not black, right? I'm a kid who grew up in Hawaii. You know, to me, New York City, Canton, New York was the Far East, right? It's yeah. like, <laughs> I'm, I'm basically looking at these kids mm -hmm. like on, you know, on the movie screen and on the TV screen and going, wow, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. I want to be like that, but also not necessarily coming from that similar type of background at all, right? Um, so I'm coming from that. I'll, I'm, I'll qualify that as my position to start. Mm -hmm. But what I will say is, is that a lifetime of this, of being like engaged in hip hop, has been the hip hop's been the biggest teacher in my life, um, and it's taught me everything that I know. 
and I say that unqualifiedly, like mm-hmm. everything, everything, yeah. all the stuff that I've, I've been able to do, I understand through, through hip hop, mm-hmm. meaning that I understand it through black freedom culture, meaning that I understand it through the black freedom struggle. But if we put, if we started putting a box around that, would that exchange have been possible? Mm-hmm. One of the things that people tells me that one of the things that people tell me all the time, and you hear this from the pioneers, you, you'll hear this from Herc, you'll hear this from Flash, is like you can't account for inspiration, right? Mm. Herc gets this record that is sister hands him, and it's a bunch of German folks who look like robots, mm-hmm. and he's like <laughs> listening to it, and yeah. he's like, "Damn, this is funky, right?" Right, right, right. And these <laughs> these robot folks, this Kraftwerk group. Yeah. Yeah. was influenced by james brown right yeah, yeah before yeah, they were yeah. like like at the same time that they're doing noise stuff they're like listening to james brown and they're like what if we combine the noise stuff and james brown and these new little synthesizer mm. things that we got right mm. so you can't mm-hmm. account nobody can account for for the way that inspiration flows right and that's a right. beautiful thing like if you and i are talking that's an exchange we're communicating with each other and and out of this conversation like you said like something cool might be coming out of that right like we are both getting enlightened we're enlightening each other like we're not that doesn't that's not to say that i'm coming from the same place that you are in terms of um power privilege all of those kinds of things but if we have a conversation and we're then able to get in and we're i I don't play music but if we were able to have a musical conversation and that kind of thing that's beautiful that's a beautiful type of thing what is where, where it goes wrong is when the exploitation comes in. And so if we stand mm-hmm. for conversation, exchange, innovation, and we stand against like exploitation, extraction, erasure of yeah. the roots of this all, then like we could create something really cool. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying no. I even know how to do it. Yeah. I'm just saying like I'm in favor of the exchange and I'm, I'm in favor of folks doing it right because I want people to be able to have have that kind of communication. I want to be able to vibe with you. Um, yeah, well, you know, this concept of enlightenment, I love it because mm. I view art as an, a divine infusion of thought. It's precognitive thinking, and it's something wow. that we yeah. get every single day. So mm-hmm. every single day, I'm in my studio. I have a brand new idea every day. Yeah. So these ideas all kind of just come from life, right? So mm. this leads me to this statement where I'll say that the stylistic elements of music, it's not solely derivative of race, but of culture. Culture, right. And, and hip hop didn't come to, into existence because blacks are blacks or Puerto Ricans are Puerto Ricans. Right. Its, it, its manifestation was a result of the pressure built up by history, neglect, social conditions, and right. the will to release their struggles creatively, right? Right, right, so, right, right? So so, my thing is this. I always say that as somebody that's a Black musician, I don't care if other non-Black people create Black music. Mm-hmm. I care about people creating music that they identify with culturally. It's mm-hmm. part of their ethnic makeup, right? Mm-hmm. Not racial makeup, their right. ethnic makeup. Right. This is what they're about, and they're just doing their thing. And when it comes to showing love, you just provide the credit. You know what I'm saying? You show where it comes from, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so what's crazy when it comes to music? It's when we're con- when we're talking about this concept of misappropriation, right? Yeah. You know, there's hip hop cats that I know. That if they sample a record and make a new beat, they act as though they made the initial record. Right. Right? No matter where right. it came from. Right? Right. So right. they sample, right. let's just right. say they, they they sample something from the Far East. If they right. sample it, they act like they made that original record and mm-hmm. do not take in to, 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 to context the notion of misappropriation. Mm. Are you giving props for where it come from? Or you mm-hmm. say, hey, man, don't say nothing. I don't want to get caught. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, like, it goes so deep, right? But yeah. it's about us just showing love. And right. I wanted to use this to segue mm. into 
your master, you have a master in Asian studies, right? Asian, Asian American studies. Asian yeah. American studies. So yeah. mm -hmm. how did hip hop help to shape the AAPI communities in America and around the world? Uh, it's a powerful question. Yes. And I just, I just want to say, I love that idea, right? Because it goes, mm -hmm. it goes in the other direction. I mean, and I love this idea about separating, not separating, but like defining this thing of race versus just defining this thing of culture. Yes. Because we create culture together. Yes, absolutely. And culture is not something that's fixed. It's never right. been fixed. Absolutely. It's always been fluid. So yes. things yes, flow yes. in, things flow out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things get created out of these exchanges. I just love right. that idea. Right. And just to be able to say like this notion of cultural justice, yeah. right? It's about restoring like what was taken from us. Yes. But it's also about allowing us to be able to be seen and to see each other mm -hmm. in our full humanity. So mm -hmm. As a as like an Asian American and a Pacific Islander, I'm Chinese and Native mm -hmm. Hawaiian, mm -hmm. like influenced by hip hop, right? Like I'm just one of millions of other kids who like have been influenced by this. Yeah. And um and I think that it's really important. It's I think it's my job actually to be able to talk to my Asian American, you know, folks and my Pacific Islander folks and be able to say, just like you said, like, let's like show the credit. Let's Let's get to the root. Let's go to the details of this because mm -hmm. actually in this are a whole bunch of things that help us to survive as well. Right? right. And then and then we can add into that the kinds of things that will allow other folks to be able to like our our things that we've developed to be able to mm -hmm. survive, right? Like those can be gifts to other people. Like think about I'm just thinking about like Riza and his love mm -hmm. for martial arts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Like mm -hmm. he's literally learned like or, or Forrest Whitaker and Ghost Dog, one of my mm -hmm. favorite movies of all time, right? Mm -hmm. Like just this idea of being able to take these ideas um, uh, that help you to be able to survive and thrive. Right. And, that be, and then that makes you, right? right. How hip hop is Bruce Lee? Bruce Lee is all hip hop, right? <laughs> you know what I'm like, saying? I mean, that's like, the, that's like literally the next book that I'm working on. And I, it's like, wow. It's like every time you get into like, let's, let's, check, like, let's check out this confluence of things, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Bruce Lee, makes enter the dragon in 1973 mm -hmm. right um this is this is going to be his statement and mm -hmm. this is his statement like it's a love letter in some ways right to to uh to asian americans mm -hmm. like to the future mm -hmm. right to this idea that's barely my boy it's like the idea of asian america is born in 1968 he makes mm -hmm. this movie five years later it's mm -hmm. like this love letter to the future right mm -hmm. saying like you all can be represented. You all will be represented. People mm. will see you. They'll see you as strong. And he's able to put in all of these different types of things into it, right? All of the different types of ideas that he has, his philosophies, finger pointing away to the moon, like mm -hmm. all of this stuff, emotional content, all of that mm -hmm. stuff, right? He's able to put into this movie and mm -hmm. offer it up as this gift. This movie comes out like just weeks after he dies on July 20th, mm -hmm. right? The movie comes out weeks later, uh, and then the first hip hop party, August eleventh, nineteen seventy three. Everything is happening in nineteen seventy three. Bob mm. Marley and the Whalers come out in nineteen seventy three with mm. Catch a Fire, mm. right? So if you look at the global popular culture that we have right now, it's born in nineteen seventy three of wow. hip hop, Damn. reggae, and Bruce Lee, right mm. there. The Damn. summer of nineteen seventy three. This wow. like like this three week period right wow i catch a fire maybe came out in april i think or something mm. but it really starts to hit during the summer months so it's wild and 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 that's why like all of these things kind of come up together right this this like whole this right. sort of sufferer's point of view from the like the you know the tenement yards of kingston jamaica to like the 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 junks on the ocean and the harbor at hong kong to this house party in the South Bronx. Like wow. that's the Bermuda Triangle of power that happens in 1973. And wow. I think that that's like, that's actually a, this beautiful moment that we can kind of look back to as like, wow, like think about the possibilities that are sown if you draw the lines at that particular moment in that particular time. So that's deep, man. Um, <laughs> so yeah. if I fast forward okay. to China. Yeah. Did China ban hip hop? 
I mean, it was really interesting, right? They tried to do this reality show uh, last year called The Rap of China, and yeah. and uh, and it got out of control. Like the government couldn't control it anymore. Well, what does that know? mean? What does that mean? I it think, got under control. I think that what happens is is you know they were trying to capture. Uh, their first of all, their TV is obviously really really censored. Yeah, you know, and I know folks here in the U.S. Uh, who are actually working with uh with them on trying to inject a lot of this stuff back in like how can we actually bring the history of hip-hop into the support for this particular show right rap of china right but at some point they wanted it just to be this cool little like you know reality tv show thing that they could kind of like manage and control and stuff but the thing is is hip-hop in china goes back like over I mean, what is it? It's 2021 now. It goes back over two decades now, mm. right? And and it is the sound of, as it is everywhere else, like disenfranchised young youth, yeah, right? And the kind of thing that that has happened is like along with all of the different things that you have going on, um, you have a lot of tensions in Chinese society. A lot of times it comes out in the music, mm. right? And that's so, very anti-Chinese government. Yeah, I mean, it. you know, and yeah, it's not always anti-Chinese government, but but a lot of times, you know, stuff will come out, right? And and that's just how hip hop is always been. It's been that kind of voice for for marginalized folks. So I, I think that you know the I don't know what the future is of of the show at this particular point, but um, you know they stepped back a lot from it because yeah. it wasn't going to be like this pretty type of thing. Um, when you're starting to get to a lot of these yeah. folks who are actual prote- practitioners of hip hop in China. Yes. Yeah. So from what yeah. I from what I know, it went when it came out. It was actually the first the first edition was out in 2017, and mm-hmm. um, it was like a hit. And then they banned it, saying that it should not feature actors with tattoos or depict mm-hmm. hip hop culture, subculture, and immoral culture. And right. there was all this censorship. So then. They came back and renamed it, and 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 one of the criticisms was that it commoditized commodified this yeah uh-huh. this this yeah. this form of hip hop and 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 it's like it kind of brings me to my final question with you: mm. art versus commerce, right? right. So right. I'm a dude. I'm a dude. I always tell people that I stopped listening to hip hop in 2007. I always mm-hmm. tell people that. Mm-hmm. And I'm I'm hip hop to the fullest, mm-hmm. but I stopped listening in, in 2007 because that to me is when the nucleus of the culture started to change with commerce in a whole new way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's a time when, when Puff, and no disrespect to Puff, but like there was this whole, this entirely new form of R&B hip hop that was kind of taken, taken away from from my culture. And I'll give you a story. Mm. At the time, I, oh, I'm sorry, 2007. I made 97. Sorry. Not wow. Okay. Yeah. 97. Sorry. Woo. Sorry. Okay. I can't believe I said I even said 2000. Yeah. So let me go back. <laughs> I stopped. Yeah. Big huge difference. Yeah. Big difference. I stopped listening yeah. to to hip hop in 97 because of yeah. the cultural change. Yeah. So. You could literally look at how hip hop was being marketed and how the culture was being marketed and what and what was cut away. Mm-hmm. So I'm a dude that I was the guy that wanted to go to the hip hop spots with all the MCs, with all the DJs, with all the dancers. And at the same time, it's not like I didn't love the women and chilling with all the girls and getting numbers and all that stuff. But the girls I wanted to meet were wearing Tim's and polo sweaters. Mm, Those are the mm-hmm. people I was hanging out with, right? I remember at that time I had a girlfriend that was more of like a, she wasn't into the hip hop stuff as much. And I remember she said, one night I was going to this legendary hip hop club in, in, in LA called Unity. Unity. Uh, Unity, yes. Unity. Big B. Yes, Big B, right? Rest in power, uh, yeah. Yes, rest yeah. In, yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. And Love Big I remember the mm-hmm. night I was going, mm-hmm. and my girl at the time said to me, why are you doing all that dancing stuff? 
Why don't you just <laughs> focus on school and just become a lawyer and just do that? Like, why are you even doing this stuff? Mm. And that was the night I realized what she represented. She mm. represented this new legion of hip hop that I wasn't down with because mm. of the ethos that was developed from the Bronx. It's all of, it's all of this finding your identity through art. These, the five elements, it's all of that that really served as my life religion, right? Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. way of seeing life. And mm -hmm. I couldn't look at life from the perspective of getting jiggy with it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. I couldn't do that. That just wasn't me. And that's when I left. Not to say that dope hip hop wasn't made after 97, because obviously it was. Mm -hmm. But I left that side and I just got deeper into records. And I yeah. just, you know what I'm saying? It just went mm -hmm. that way. And I, and I never looked back. So I say this all to say, Am I stupid for <laughs> <laughs> am I stupid for being so critical on people that claim to be so hip hop, but they're really more so about the product and not the art? I mean, I wouldn't frame the question that way at all, Adrian. Like I, I would be like <laughs> But I do think I want to go back to like the thing yeah. that she kind of introduced it with, right? Because there is this tension yeah. in hip hop that really starts I mean, it's there kind of from the beginning, but this sort of hip hop as a commodity, yeah. hip, -hop as, hip hop as a product is something you're selling and hip hop as a community thing, right? As something yeah. that's building community. 97, man, like it's deep that you, that you kind of decided that 97 was your, your point of departure, if you will, because yeah. I mean, 97 was a turning point for, for so many of us, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the year that Tupac gets killed. Mm -hmm. And then just months later, Biggie gets shot as well mm -hmm. and murdered as well in L.A. And, and, and like you had unity and then you had all of the sort of industry kind of things. And the industry things, one of these things is where Biggie gets killed, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just sort of, it's almost too metaphorical, right? Like yeah. Biggie, uh, Big A B passes away. Yeah. Um, and, and unity, like, you know, we, we don't have unity anymore i mean it sounds weird to say, say it in that way but i almost kind of mean the pun mm, mm. and and at the same time like you know you have you have Big E, right at the peterson automotive mm -hmm, museum mm -hmm. right down there on wilshire mm -hmm. and he ends up getting shot right and that's like a direction that hip-hop is taking yeah. it's literally driving north right like and mm. and getting shot right mm -hmm. and ending up at cedar sinai and it's like it's ill for me because i think about this moment all the time and i think about 97 a lot man yeah. it was like that was a traumatic year for so many of us uh, 97 much. and 98 like we're, we're like tragic tragic like traumatic like nine months and um yeah i think about it a lot and so when i would go back and teach these classes i'd be trying to introduce this concept at the very beginning i'd be like look right you all think of hip-hop most of you probably sitting in this room who are not deeply engaged in the culture. And I know that there's a lot of you who are. Like I probably have all of the B-boys and B-girls on campus yeah. here in this room with me, but many of you understand hip hop through what has been, like what people are making money off of. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. that kind of hip hop. Yeah. Um, that, you know, so hip hop is a commodity. You've seen hip hop as a mm -hmm. commodity. Let me sort of show you all of the ways that it's been about community from the very beginning. Yeah. And then that allows you to connect up with all of these mm. different types of movements that are happening all around the world. And what makes it still so vibrant that you and I can still be in it like all these years later, because right? yeah. we've still been able to find our communities around it. Um, and that's, that's the, I think that's sort of the struggle of uh, our, our sort of struggle just sort of writ large, right? Like, that's like, deep. The piece of, of us coming together, mm -hmm. right? Forming, like getting in the cipher together, like being in place with each other, being in space and time, mm -hmm. moving together, mm -hmm. literally moving together, right? Like that's, that's building community. And then the stuff that's commodity stuff, it's all this fizzy type of stuff that I can mm -hmm. email to you or mm -hmm. stream or all this other kind of stuff. Like how do we get a handle on that and how does that make us more human? 
Wow. Like that's like that's the struggle that we're we're kind of facing. So I, I'm with you. I'm I, I think about it all the time. I well, think about it every day. I, I think I think so. you kind of landed on it though, because there is this severed connection mm. to the birthplace, right? Mm. Mm-hmm. And the sentiment. Yeah. Uh this sanctified notion of if you are of this community, mm. you follow these beliefs, right? Mm-hmm. And and I like I said, I'm a, I'm okay with people making product, right? Yeah, of but, course. You we know all what gotta saying? live. Yeah. yeah, and and it's not like people yeah. in hip hop didn't want to make money doing stuff. No, you know what I'm absolutely. saying? So like For come on, right? Right. Yeah. But but when hip hop is severed from its roots, it bothers me because I know how much hip hop has changed the world. And even with it being severed from its roots, it's still changing the world in many ways, right? Because there's still big yeah. artists that are still connected to it, right? Absolutely. You know, so you know, with hip hop, exclusion has turned into inclusion mm. on different terms, and we are all mm-hmm. fighting for more equity. And I'm glad that our culture has empowered the world to speak up. I'm glad mm-hmm. that there are people like you that further legitimize our beliefs with context and history. And I want to sincerely thank you, Jeff, for being part mm-hmm. of Invisible Blackness, man. Oh, man. It was, it's, it was such an honor. It was such a pleasure. It was such an enlightenment, man, to be thank able to, you. to be with you. Yes, more, more, less exploitation, more sanctification. <laughs> My name is Jeff Chang, and you're listening to Invisible Blackness. Mm-hmm.